All right, good morning, happy Monday, welcome, and let's stand and begin with a prayer and a pledge of allegiance. Heavenly Father, we uh, give you praise for this beautiful summer day and for uh, a break in the rain and lots of sunshine to help dry things out, but we thank you for that rain also, and we look forward to the next time it comes. We thank you for this crowd that's gathered here today and for the commissioners and county officials and employees that are here to support uh, the organization and the function of this county. We just uh, turn this agenda over to you today, Father. There are several things on there that we always need help and guidance with. We don't have all the answers. We know that you do, and we just pray that you would uh, share your uh, direction with us. We pray for our first responders our locally and abroad for our uh, those that serve in the military and just pray for their safety. We thank you for our police. We thank you for our firefighters. We thank you for those that work in the hospital and uh, those that provide emergency management. We're thankful for all of the uh, employees that work for the county, Lord, and for all the elected officials. And we thank you for this community and how you have blessed us, and we pray that it will continue. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, today is the 14th day of June, 2021, it's just after 9 a.m., and we'll begin our uh, commissioner's court meeting, our first regular meeting of the month. Item number one is public comment time and or request for information on non-agenda items. You are welcome to speak at this time. You can wait till a specific agenda item. Is there anyone that would like to speak at this time? All right, we'll move on. Item number two, let's consider and possibly approve minutes from our last meeting three weeks ago, May 24th. Make a motion we approve the minutes. Motion to approve that set of minutes is made by Commissioner Parker. Second. Second by Commissioner Fitch. Any comments or discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you, Joyce, for preparing those. Item number three, report from commissioners regarding road work status. I'll start with Commissioner Precinct 4 and work this way. Uh, mostly what we've been doing is patching. We've had a, a lot of holes and all that we've been trying to get filled up and, and all and, and back in shape from the rain and the ice and all. Uh, we've also... Uh, Put in a few culverts for some individuals and a couple across some roads. Got several more of those to put in uh, here in the next week or two, hopefully. Uh, we've been side cutting and mowing uh, and uh, trying to get, get some of that done. We got our new machine in Monday and uh, uh, run it some on Tuesday and, and it done a good job for us. So we're, we're glad to have that to be able to have something that, that will take care of us and, and run us for a long time. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Precinct 3. We've been uh, fixing road failures and stuff and we've been uh, picking up trees and then, uh, like I said, right now we've got a lot of culvert failures. We're trying to replace and get them because of all the rain and stuff and it's, we got a bunch of water, roses underwater just washed them away and we're trying to catch up. We're putting a culvert in on the uh, Cooper Chapel Road today for the sawmill and everything. So we got about eight culverts we got to put in between now and then since it's all finally decided to uh, drop a little bit. So and we're uh, mowing and side cutting. So and that's about it. Yeah. All right. Uh, rain it really caused a lot of potholes, so we did a lot of patching and some uh, blade patching also. To smooth up, repair some soft spots. Um, 2300, we had a side uh, retaining wall on about a 48 inch culvert. We uh, fixed that all back and hauled some concrete out there where it washed really bad. A lot of trees were down. Um, 
Uh, we went out to uh, County Road 2500. We had a bad soft spot kind of washed out all the way across the road, got that repaired. We have been uh, working on uh, 1250, 1070, and 2180, hauling a lot of wrap out there and packing it, restoring those roads up. And uh, this week we've started on 1030 to finish. We're going to try to finish that up and have it ready for chip sealing. Uh, we should have it done this week. I, I, I would imagine we probably won't have any chip sealing start till the first part of July. Since we're all about a month or so behind, maybe six weeks, where we usually are. So I just figure that's my goal. And uh, once July gets here, we'll make it all around the county, you know, and all the precincts. It'll, it'll get pretty busy. That's all I have. All right. Commissioner One. We finished up with County Road 1350 and 1355, got those roads ready for chip seal. We reconstructed County Road 1345, and now it's ready for chip seal. Been patching lots of potholes, and we are getting ready to lay hot mix on County Road 1670. All right, thank you. Item number four, we have with us today Shirley Dickerson, our chief appraiser from the appraisal district. Shirley wants to make a brief comment on their 2022 proposed budget. Welcome, Shirley. Good morning. Thank you all for having me back. Uh, I also, before we go into the uh, 2022 proposed budget, uh, my favorite part of this, this time is when I get to bring money back to you all. Um, we did finish under budget for 2021, or for 2020 again, so after our audit we did have some money left over, and as y'all know, we're not allowed to keep any funds that were provided to us by the entities. So um, I did bring y'all a check today for $19,449.68. Uh, so that will be the remainder of what was left for 2020. Um, last year in our 2021 budget, we were able to cut the budget about 5%. This year we're looking at about a 9.8% increase. Um, part of that is due to the fact that we have to replace our server, which is something we absolutely can't do without. Um, and we can't keep money from the year before to go towards something like that. So we had to budget for that. Um, we budgeted for a 5% increase in um, benefits and salaries. And everything else is more on the lines of our uh, providers, like our software providers and the people that provide the support for our software. So. Um, that's where the increase is coming from. I hope that I'm here next year giving y'all money back. Uh, but of course, I can't see the future. I don't think that we will be able to be using all of that, but we do have to be prepared to replace everything that we need replaced. So. Okay. All right. Any questions for Shirley? All right. Thank you for Thank you. Uh, Thank you. bringing us a check. All right, let's get a motion just to uh, recognize that we uh, accept that check from Shirley and along with her information on the budget. Make a motion. Motion's made by Commissioner Applewhite. Second. Second, Commissioner Parker. Questions, comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Item number five, we have a presentation by Steve Austin with the Titus County Historical Commission. And Steve wants to talk to us about placing some Titus County flags, not Texas flags, not U.S. flags, but Titus County flags. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Good to be with you, Commissioners, on this appropriate day, being Flag Day, in addition to U.S. Army birthday. So congratulations to all the veterans today's flag day, so this is an appropriate presentation. Uh, as most of the commissioners are aware, we adopted a Titus County flag five years ago, actually on March 14th, uh, 2016. And uh, my proposal today is that we provide flags for most county uh, offices, uh, locations. Uh, there is a program by the only producer of the county flag at this time has been authorized, CRW. And they have a special offering of uh, flag sets where you get the flag, the stand, the appropriate hardware, uh, 
in one one price for $211 each. I spoke with uh, accounting and we have $2,818.88 available. Of course, we'll use that 19000 if y'all don't have anything to do with it. <laughs> but I'm proposing that we utilize those funds in the Historical Commission for the acquisition of those flags. I made a presentation for or a proposal of 12 flags and identified some locations that be here in the Commissioner's Court, the courtrooms at the Annex and uh, the uh, Justice Center. Uh, well, there's some other locations for the commissioner's offices, possibly the judge's office, depending on how far the funds go. I also like to get uh, one outdoor flag. Now, the flags for the offices would be uh, similar to the flags uh, here in the courtroom. Uh, they'd be on an eight-foot stand with a finial uh, and gold tassel and gold fringe for indoor parade. I also propose that we get at least one outdoor flag to utilize on the north flagpole on the appropriate days, uh, especially during the month of March, which is Texas History Month, and uh, Titus County Flag Day is March 14th. Uh, to remind you, this is one of the smaller flags. Of course, the flags would be three by five and an eight foot pole with a spear point finial. And, uh, the process of acquisition, I can make the order, or I can work through James to make the order, uh, whatever is appropriate, uh, determine the number, uh, and uh, make the order through CRW flags, and when we get the final amount, it, which would include taxes and everything else, uh, then make the check for that and send it off and get the flags and all the stands and stuff thereafter. I uh, don't I don't want to present uh, a specific number of flags or locations, but I think that we're asking for the commissioner to approve an amount not to exceed the amount of funds available, which I'm told at this time is $2,818.88, so it would be some amount less than that. Uh, to refresh your memory, this is Titus County flag. This is one of the smaller versions. Identifies uh, Fort Sherman in 1846 when the county was uh, authorized. Uh, symbolic of Texas history that uh, I don't know if you were familiar with the Zapata flag, which had Texas around the star. Back in early days, it was never an official flag, but it was presented. Also, I'm going to place on the, the body blue flag for the Texas history. Uh, the facets of the star represent the many facets of Tyus County. And, uh, of course, the county silhouette. For those of you who haven't seen, this is Tyus County flag. Have any questions? Explain to us again where the money's. Is this historical commission funds? These are historical commission funds donated by citizens of Titus County and other entities, and we've utilized them for monuments, memorials, and other aspects regarding the history of Titus County. Is all of that balance of roughly 2000 available to purchase these flags? Yes, $2,818.88. How many locations were in that list you gave me? Was it about? 12, 12 identified uh, with the uh, funds that make it available to get at least three outdoor flags, but I'm only seeking to get one outdoor flag. Uh, there may be more offices or less offices that should be authorized. Uh, among some additional locations were the Civic Center, for their stage, make it available for citizens of Titus County to be able to see it, and um, possibly the uh, city council chambers. You know, we may ask them for reimbursement, but uh, I think they're deserving of a flag as well. Okay. 
why don't my suggestion would be why don't you put together a list and knowing what the, the outdoor flag will cost a little more I guess no no it doesn't because the parade flag has tassel and fringe comes with the stand and all the hardware that would be two hundred and eleven dollars each okay the single flag uh, from the producer at this time is sixty-five dollars. Okay. That's with two grommets available to put on the flagpole. So, is this a donation from the historical commission to the county? Exactly, how does this work? Right. Uh, the the uh, funds are in the general fund of the county, earmarked for Titus County Historical Commission. So, there's not a separate account for Titus County Historical Commission in that regard. It is a, a, a sum of money identified in the general fund of the county. Uh, that's you, and you won't need these funds through the end of the year for anything. You won't need that, those funds for anything else through the uh, end of the year. No, we have no activity plan at this time. If we have additional funds or uh, activities, you know, we can do fundraisers and two and then make a presentation to the commissioner court for possible considerations on acquisition of funds. But these funds were not cost the taxpayer or the uh, county any funds out of the general fund. Okay. All right. So what Steve is telling you about two hundred dollars a flag, we could get somewhere around nine flags, maybe ten flags at this time. Uh, and understand that these are funds that we have budgeted for use by the historical commission sounds like they are not going to use them if you want to uh, approve using that roughly two thousand dollars to buy several flags and put them in the proposed locations that steve's talking about i think that's your consideration yep. and if we approve that then i think you should approve steve to come up with the the best possible list and utilization of those funds if you want to use none, some, or all of that $2,000. Any discussion? I think we need to table this until we can discuss with each other how many we actually want to use, and but I don't think we need them in, the, in our barns or our precincts, you know, so I think we need to discuss it though. Could you? provide for us before the next meeting a list of you know a wish list of all the ones that you think would be appropriate and then these guys can kind of say i agree with this this and this and maybe they'll spend the whole amount maybe they'll spend something shy of that and then sure. we could consider that expenditure next month i mean next meeting yeah absolutely okay thank you right. for being the force behind that originally and for uh bringing up an opportunity to make these flags public Yes, sir. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Steve. All right. I have a motion to table for the time being. Make that motion. No, I have one already. All right. Second. Then. Second. Motion to table. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> All right. Item number six we have a presentation from Chief Larry McRae regarding fire protection in Titus County and the city of Mount Pleasant. I. I called Chief McCray a couple of weeks ago and said, would you be willing to uh, start making the discussion of fire protection in general within the county and, and, of course, the city as well, primarily to keep the commissioners informed of the state of affairs within the fire protection community? as well as to educate the public, those that are in attendance today, those that will watch on our YouTube channel. And I think that the better informed we all are, the better able we will be to make decisions. This is a very expensive uh, service in the city and the county to provide adequate number of firefighters, the facilities, the equipment, the, uh, the vehicles, to provide fire protection. And right now the county spends roughly a million dollars to uh, compensate the city for supplementing our volunteer services. And we've had so many different discussions over the last few years. Uh, we had a 
consultant talk to us about the best way to cover the entire county and what that would look like and I believe that's the model that we're following right now that consultant was what five years ago 2016 2016 and we've had in the last five years we've lost a department over there in Winfield we've come dangerously close to losing Sugar Hill and that's still in flux right now and the commissioners are going to annually be faced with decisions about how to best protect the citizens of the county the city makes the decisions about fire protection within the city but we in effect tap into those resources to provide supplemental services for the county and as we move forward we have certain things that can happen negatively and that would be a reduction in volunteer firefighter manpower uh, that might cause us to be more reliant upon the city fire department and so as we move forward and we'll discuss it in budget this year we'll discuss it next year when we renew our contract with the city and the better able you guys are to know what's going on in the fire protection world the better able you're going to be to make decisions and those decisions could be any number of things it could be uh, to approve an increase in the amount of money that you pay to the city because you feel like uh, you're more dependent upon them and you have to share in the support of their uh, manpower that services both city and county you could decide that you want to have uh, an opportunity to break away from the dependence on the city of Mount Pleasant and create a county paid fire department of professional firefighters you always have the option of an emergency services district that's used in a lot of uh, towns typically in those that are larger than us where the city takes care of the city and the emergency services district or districts take care of portions of the county lastly you have the option of saying to the citizens we're no longer able to fund fire protection at a level that guarantees the kind of service that you've received in the past and in, in other words we're not going to be able to give you the blanket of protection that you have enjoyed in years past because it's gotten so expensive and so the question comes up what are you going to do which one of those directions are you going to go in and so I depend upon the chief and he and I visit multiple times per week and I have the benefit of knowing what is going on in the fire uh, protection world specifically within our volunteer fire departments and how dependent they are upon the city so I've asked the chief to start doing this about every couple of months keep us informed keep the general public informed so that there's no false sense of security out there and that we understand just how much money it takes to run both a volunteer department a professional department at the city of Mount Pleasant and how do we work together in the most efficient possible way so chief you have brought us a lot of information and I don't know that we have time to go over in detail everything that you have brought us here but I do want these commissioners to be familiar with the kind of reports that you can supply to us on a regular basis so that when they receive these they know what to look for so that they can see are we holding steady are we doing better are we doing worse what's been going on out there how many calls have you gotten that you've had to respond to in the county how many volunteers have been able to show up for those calls uh, are there ever situations where we've got a situation that comes up where the city is busy the county gets a fire call or vice versa where your department can't be in multiple places at one time and understand what the potential problem is when a situation like that occurs and then for those of you in the public if anybody wants to 
be kept informed and see these reports, I'll be able to make those available to you. I can email them to you. But I want you, ladies and gentlemen, to be aware of what's going on. So I'll be quiet now. Chief, thanks for being here. And tell us what we need to uh, know about the reports that you brought for us today. All right, thank you, Judge. Uh, just to go over the agreement that the, the county has now uh, asked all the volunteers to sign, all the volunteer part, departments to sign, that's going to require them to submit within 30 days uh, at, after the end of the month uh, a list of the runs that they've made with their signatures and all that. Uh, also, their training report on who was at the training, what was done, and uh, who conducted it and all that. Uh, they're also supposed to have a training program equivalent to the State Farms and Fire Marshal Association's program. doesn't mean they have to join that program, it just means they need to have a training program that is equivalent to that. One of the things that's required for the, in the agreement is 20 hours annually of training uh, offered by the department, as well as developing the standard operating procedures within those departments. And I would remind you, this does not apply to Talco. Talco has their own contract, so all of what I'm talking about does not apply to the city of Talco or the Talco Fire Department. <clears throat> as far as training, the state of Texas does not require training for volunteers at all. Uh, you don't, there's no state requirement. For the paid departments, yes, there is requirements. It's the uh, Texas Commission on Fire Protection regulates career departments, and we have the standards we have to go by. And even though the state doesn't require that, uh, years ago, the, our county fire chiefs meet once a month, and we, we all recognize that there is a need for training for volunteer firemen. So uh, we put that uh, in place uh, of having training for the volunteers. I believe that the county citizens as well as the county commissioners would expect the, the people that are responding to fires, volunteer paid, to have the training. And, uh, and so that's, uh, we recognized that years ago. Hey, Chief, why does the state not require any training of volunteer departments? It's a good question. Uh, they just never have. There's the State Farmers and Fire Marshals Association that has a, a voluntary uh, certification program that a, that a fire department can voluntarily join, but there's nothing that mandates any training for volunteers in the state of Texas. Thanks. Um, as I said, you know, the, the training is, is, if you'll look at the, uh, the report that looks like this, all the orange on that report um, is training that those people do not have. Uh, and you can see there is quite a bit of orange in some departments uh, where they do not, they lack the training for that. Each one of those columns that, that just has a letter at the top, that's a specific type of training or a module of training? If you look on the last page, there's a legend uh, of what that means. And uh, you, you literally have, have a list of each firefighter within each volunteer fire department, and then you've indicated a yellow square would mean that we have some training that's, that's lacking. Yes. And so... And we update this pretty much at every chief's meeting. Uh, Typo's not updated theirs uh, in a few months, but the other departments have updated theirs uh, as of the last meeting we had. Okay. So, like I said, the, the agreement requires the, the training program. And, well, it's our benefit, too, to have the volunteers trained uh, so that when we're out there that we have assets that we can use. And so, you know, Ever since I've been the chief, we've always offered the training to any of the volunteers they want to come. And again, we're, we're just going to say that we're going to provide the training. You know, we have state certified instructors. We're a state certified training facility for career firefighters. Um, if you go to college, uh, it's about two thousand dollars a pop to to get a uh, structural firefighter training. We're going to do it all for free. All the volunteers have to do is give their time. We're setting up a, uh, we're changing a little bit, so we're setting up a Dropbox account. That'll be sort of like doing it online. The lessons, the PowerPoints, all that will be out there that they'll have access to, so they can be at home doing whatever they're doing, just like online. Do the, the reading, the lessons, and all that, 
and then come to us and we can do the, the uh, written test and the skills test so that they show us what they're doing. That's the book, uh, the Essentials Manual right there that we're teaching out of. Uh, as you can see, it's a pretty, pretty large book. Uh, but again, we're going to do everything we can to provide training to any of the volunteers that want to take advantage of it free of charge. Do you go to their firehouse? Do they come to you? Is there a centralized offering? Uh, they can come to the fire station. Now that COVID's over, uh, we're back doing training in the station. It's where we have all the visual aids, the, uh, the training materials, the, the equipment, the props, and all that are at the fire station. So it, it'd be advantageous for them to come to, to the station. Uh, like I said, it's free of charge. All they got to do is, like on drill nights, uh, if they want to do it, just give us a little bit of a heads up. Hey, we'd like to come and train on vehicle fires. We can certainly accommodate that. We've got a burn house out behind the water plant uh, that we can do live fire training in. We've got a prop for an old vehicle out there we can set on fire. So we have all the abilities to train volunteer firemen. We've been training career firefighters for almost 20 years at the college. So we, we know what we're doing on training. So uh, again, the, uh, uh, once they give us the information on their emails where they can access the Dropbox, then they'll have all the lessons there. They can do those at their leisure, or we can, like I said, do it on the drill night and do that. Um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a few hours of training, and again, it's whatever the volunteers want to be trained in. Everybody may not want to be a structural firefighter. They may just want to help at the fire station on, you know, filling air cylinders or, you know, loading hose or doing, there's a lot of things you can do on the fire ground that don't need to be a structurally trained firefighter, but are important tasks. So again, it's kind of up to the volunteers. What do you want to be trained in? We'll train you in it. So uh, again, it's it's on their part to do that. The uh, we are, We're scheduling countywide training once a month. We were doing that for years and COVID kind of got in the way of that. But, like this month, we're going to do a countywide uh, tanker shell operation. So we get up here in Industrial Park, everybody brings their tankers in, and we, we do tanker shells like we're doing a structure fire. So again, free of charge, all they got to do is show up. You know, I suspect that the, uh, the citizens out there are expecting when they call for a volunteer fire department or have a fire, they want people that are going to show up that are trained. Just like if y'all hire a road hand, you're not going to put him out there on the on your crew and let them start working without doing some training. Same concept here. Have the people that are trained to do the job. Um, I will say um, we, we're also going to track their training. We're going to load all the volunteers, members into our software at the station. So when they do training, if they, when we conduct it, we'll load that in. So the chiefs Anytime they need a report, we can print a report out showing who's got the training on what and where, where's the, the, uh, the need for the training. So again, we're going to do everything we can to be able to train the volunteers in, in Titus County. It's going to be up to them to give their time and effort. It's all, it's all we're asking for them. Um, like I said, you know, there's been some questions about the Sugar Hill Fire Department. Uh, they have turned in some training and I, for a few of their members, and I've had the opportunity to go through and, and review that. Some of the training is six to nine years old, and there's been a lot of change in the last six to nine years, especially if you hadn't had any CEIs, continuing education, which that's, again, something that the State Farms and Fire Marshals Association program requires is, is uh, continuing education and the state for the career guys we have to have 20 hours a year at least 20 hours a year so even though some of the members have had some training it's been six to nine years since they've had it and the fact that they really haven't applied it in quite a number of years too so what we would need to do at some point is you know, run them through a refresher course the other caveat we have right now for the for the members that want to form the volunteer fire department up in, in Sugar Hill is until they're members of a department, we can't have them attend our training because they're not covered under insurance. They're civilians. And if they were to get hurt, which we've had some people get hurt in training, 
then you know we don't we don't want to expose the city to any liability. So once they get it up and running, we'd be more happy to, to do the training. But um, the other thing too to understand is is once Sugar Hill does get up and running, uh, those members are going to be responding without any training except for the ones that have turned in some training. So just bear that in mind that you're going to have people responding without training. So the community just needs to be aware of that. Also to clarify again at Sugar Hill, it, it was stated that it takes us 30 minutes to get to Sugar Hill and we respond out of the Delwood station. We don't respond out of Delwood, we respond out of the station across from uh, the hospital. And depending on where the district is, where the call is in the district, we can be there from 10 to 25 to 30 minutes. But we have to go out on the northeast part of the district. It's going to take us a while because the roads don't allow any traffic or speed to get there. But we can get into the district uh, basically to 1402 to 71. That's about 13 minutes from station two. So again, it depends on where it is in the district as to where, to how long it's going to take us to get there. Um, as far as the other one of the other reports that you have up there that looks like this uh, that's an update through April of the volunteer response uh, is at the end of April we had 121 volunteer firemen in the county uh, 31 of those which is 20, about 25 percent uh, make more than 25% of the calls. 90% or 90 of them, which is about 75%, make less than 25%, which is one out of four calls. And of those 90, 38 of them have made no calls at all, at all. So in essence, out of the 121 that you've got on the roll, you've really got about 31 that are active. It also, the agreement also required the uh, departments to develop standard operating procedures. We have emailed out our SOPs for those particular SOPs, uh, what they need to develop, so they can use ours as a template. The thing that they need to do on their SOPs is develop, one, how they're going to operate. If we respond with them, they need to also have language in there that says, so if Mount Pleasant doesn't respond, how are you going to respond? or operate on the scene, and then what are you going to do if you get there first and we're coming? So uh, again, uh, we, we talked about August 31st as the target date to try to get those in. Uh, and we will help them do those. Like I said, we, we send them in Word documents so some can be as easy as cut and paste and changing the name on some. Some of them are actually going to have to tweak it to meet that. <clears throat> As far as Mount Pleasant uh, Fire Department versus volunteer fire departments, we've taken the last three years of data that we had in our computer system and looked at response times. Uh, 75, about 75% of the time for a structure fire anywhere in the county, Mount Pleasant Fire Department gets there first. 75% of the time. And when Mount Pleasant arrives on the scene, they get there with a four-man engine company and a deputy chief. That means when they get there, they can start fighting fire, they can make a rescue, they meet the two in, two out requirements that, for safety. Um, and even on those times when the VFDs get there before we do, we're there within two, three, five minutes after them. The thing too about when the VFDs get there is what are their capabilities when they get there? If it's just one or two guys that get there, what can they do? The, the, the national standard is you have four people on scene to be able to start fighting a fire because you have to have two in and two out. If something happens to those two inside, then the two on the outside need to come in and be able to, to assist them. Um, again, of the 122 volunteer firemen that we have listed in the county, there's 30 of, or, uh, yeah, uh, 30 show that they've had structural firefighter training. However, 10 of those work for me in and, and Pittsburgh that are career firefighters. So the other 20 that are listed as structural firefighters uh, have had the training, but again, they may not have participated in any live fire training 
since then are actually real fires. So, you know, the skill level may not be quite there where it needs to be. And, and the point there, several of the members of the volunteer departments are also employed by you. So yes. they, they have a dual role. So when we look at, like you said, 10 out of 30, while members of a volunteer fire department, yes, but part of the reason they have that yes. experience and training is because they're employed by you. Yeah, for Pittsburgh, there's a couple that work for Pittsburgh okay. there on that. Uh, the other document that I gave you was a overlapping uh, run. It looks sort of like this. Uh, one of the documents I gave you was from December, because that's really when we kind of started taking, uh, taking a look at this. And if you look in December of 2020, on a Saturday, we had uh, two, three, four, five. We had six calls that were overlapping at the same time. That was luckily nothing got away from us. I know on a couple of those we sent, we were not able to send any firefighting equipment to those calls from Mount Pleasant because we were already tied up. And what the what the overlapping calls show you, uh, that's for December. The other document is through the, the this part of the year uh, through April. Um, and about 10% of our calls overlap. And when I say overlap, that means we're already on a call and another one comes in. And luckily, uh, we haven't had anything bad happen. But, you know, the odds are going to catch up with us one of these days, I'm afraid. Uh, I believe it was last month. I believe you'll see, I believe it was last month. Yeah. Last month in May, you'll notice that on the 29th, we had two major wrecks going, one out of 67 that we had just extricated to come out of when a call come in at Argo. Luckily, the call in 67 wasn't a family of four that was trapped in a vehicle that was a major, uh, uh, tedious, manpower intensive extrication, and the same thing didn't happen in Argo. It could have just as easily, we've had wrecks where we've been trying to get people out. It took us, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes to get them out. So every time we're tied up, the chances of us being able to go somewhere else is not good. So you, you made a, a point to me the other day that I wasn't aware of. And we talk about overlapping incidents and we think, well, there's what are the chances of two fires going on at the same time but tell me the percentage of calls that you make what are they they're not all fires in fact yeah. didn't you tell me that the majority were really vehicle we, we situations make more vehicle accidents than we do structure fires or grass fires well depends on how the season of the grass fire we can run more grass fires and truly really dry than the rest but here in the last three or four years the, the vehicle accidents or what we make more of than anything. Uh, I think I didn't write that down here. Well, I might have. Um, yeah, we uh, we had to extricate. Uh, let's see. We extricate about 17. Well, maybe a little bit more. 17 to 25 extrications. That means people are trapped in their cars. And we have to get them out, basically annually. So that's in the city or out in the county. So, yeah, every, and every time we're out in the county, that leaves one engine company in the city, which is an engine with four people on it. And we send the others out in the county. Uh, every time we're in the county, we are basically maxed out. If we have a call in the city, that one engine's got to take care of it, and we're not available to go to anything else out in the county. So if we're out on a, a house fire, uh, Argo, and you had a wreck out here on, in Winfield, and you're trapped in your vehicle, you're going to be there a while because there's nobody coming to get you out because we're already tied up. We'll be calling Mount Vernon to come or somebody, but you know, we'll try to break somebody loose. Uh, so the quicker we can get back into the city, the better. We'll talk about that in a minute. One of the things, just to remind you, what our contract between the city of Mount Pleasant and the county says, 
is we're required to send two trucks and four people to the county for any call. But generally, what you're going to get, and you, you know, we've never gone by the contract as long as we've had it, which has been about 20 years or better. We've always exceeded the amount of people we've sent uh, just for the safety and being able to do what we need to do. Sending two people, it used to be two people in two trucks. Well, we can't do anything with two people. So we've always sent more people than, we, than the, the contract requires. So right now, uh, for a structure fire, if it's during the day, you're generally going to get seven people off out of the station, me, the command aide, the deputy chief, and the, and the four-man engine company. You may get three to five off-duty or volunteer firefighters out of our department. So you can get you know, from 10 to 15 out of our department on a structure fire. If it's a motor vehicle accident, uh, again, during the day, myself, command aide, the deputy chief, an engine company and the rescue truck, which is about eight, and we could have a few off duty, so you could get 11 to 13 on scene from us. And kind of the same numbers for the grass fire. So again, it's a matter of being able to send the equipment out to safely do what we need to do. And when I say safely, we're not gonna do any more than what we've got our resources to do. Uh, the National Fire Protection Association recommended Staffing for a single family 3,000 square foot house is 15 on scene. We don't even do that in the city with 15. So when we go to the county with four, you know, we, we really need help from the volunteers to help staff that. We don't have that right now. Would that be an area for potential cost savings for both us and for you is to say, we're going to limit it to what the contract calls for, two vehicles, four firefighters? instead of sending more than is contractually obligated? Probably not. I mean, because again, we're, we're, to be able to do it safely, like I said, if the engine company is going to go, there's one guy's going to have to pump the truck, there's a captain and then two firefighters. They're going to be engaged in firefighting. The deputy chief goes to the supervisor. Same thing if I go and my command aide goes. We're Side, especially if something goes wrong or it's a bad call. If it's a single family dwelling and we get there and it's you know, one room involvement, that's not a real complicated fire. But you know, if it's a well involved fire, we've got somebody that's trapped in the house, that's a problem. So, uh, yeah. Uh, bottom line is if it takes a lot of people to fight a fire, you know, I'm I'm really concerned about the, the end of this summer going into the fall. Um, if you remember in 2015, 2016, we kind of started off like this uh, with a wet, cool spring, and then we had a really, really bad fire season when the rain stopped and the grass started drying out, and then we started running fires. And as you can see by the overlapping calls, just that one day in, de in uh, December, or that one month in December, how fast things can change from not being so bad out here because they're one hour fuels which means if it's dead grass you could have dew on it in the morning and when the sun comes out an hour later it'll burn because it's already dried out a little wind behind it you know grass three foot tall that's going to be a problem that's also when our volunteers are not available generally that's when they work from noon to about dark that's when the fire grass fires are going to be out there i'm concerned about that this year so, uh, like I said, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's anybody, going back to Sugar Hill, I don't think there's anybody that disputes that we need to volunteer fire department in Sugar Hill. For, and we're going to do everything we can to go out and train to make that happen. Because, again, if they're not up there and capable, then we've got to go take care of them. Any questions? Okay. Well, again, what I want what I want to do is have Chief here every couple of months. You know, today was kind of an overview, explaining the kind of literature that you have at your disposal that he keeps on a regular basis, so that you can see how many folks do we have in each volunteer department. Of those, how many have 
had some, none, all of the training, and then of those departments, how many are able to uh, show up when those emergency calls come in because uh, admittedly most of our volunteers are, you know, they work somewhere else and they're not always available to go. And I will say this is not just a Titus County problem. This is state and nationwide. Volunteer and fire departments are, are starting to go away. People just don't have the time. Uh, you know, if you've got kids and grandkids, uh, you know, all the activities. Plus, it's, you know, we're asking a lot of you students just showed up. When I first got home, it was like you voted on that night. Here's your bumper gear, here's your pager. It goes off, show up to a fire. Looking back, a lot of that's pretty stupid. You know, they sent us out with no training. You know, luckily we didn't get anybody hurt. But nowadays, you know, we recognize that you know, sending somebody to a call with no training, they get out there and get hurt or hurt somebody. You know, it's just, you know, it's just a lot of difference between now, and even ten years ago, with the kind of fires we're fighting and, and the, all that. And people just don't have the time. It's you know, it, it's, a, it's not like volunteering at the church where, you know, you might drop the, the tape salad bowl on your toe. Out here you can go out and get injured severely or worse on these calls. So, and you're asking to do it for basically free. Since the last meeting three weeks ago, I did make a phone call to uh, Chief John Grubb, who is uh, apparently going to be the chief at the Sugar Hill Department. I just wanted him to know that this court supported him. I support him. Uh, he has contacted me at least, I think, three, four phone calls since that time. Um, I asked him to uh, be prepared to start attending those chief meetings, uh, to turn in his training material, to be familiar with the contract that we've asked the other volunteer firemen, firemen or fire departments to sign. And he was waiting for the return of Chief Clark from his vacation. Chief Clark uh, was back in town last Monday. I know that Chief Grubb and Chief Clark have talked. And it is my understanding, not through Chief Clark, but through John Mark Coburn, our county attorney, who has been uh, advising Chief Clark. Uh, it sounds to me like what the plan is, is to have a meeting as quickly as possible of the existing members of that department. I don't know what that meeting will look like, a, a, a formal retirement of those members, hopefully a voting in of some new members, and then Chief Clark wants to have an audit done of the department so that he leaves knowing exactly what he left so that it's documented. He does not want anybody coming back and uh, complaining to him that something's missing. And so that's his prerogative. If he wants to have that audit done, and that's not an audit conducted by the county, that'll be an outside auditor such as Arnold Walker. Arnold performed that audit. So this isn't going to happen overnight, but at least things are in process uh, to get that done. And Again, the sooner that they have official members of that department, then they can start attending your training and be covered by insurance in case there's any uh, injury. All right, thank you for all this information. Again, I'll make this an information available to anybody that would like to see that. And commissioners, I'll make sure you get it on a regular basis as Chief McRae provides it to me. Anyone in the general public want to ask a question while we've got Chief McRae here? Yes, sir. Ronnie, you want to come up here? My name is Ron Collins. I'm president of the center at Sugar Hill. McRae, how long will you take to get these people that have been out six or nine years back up to par on training? Barbara. We can start as soon as they 
they get their charter and are covered under the insurance now. You know, to to get to be a you know starting from scratch, to be a structural firefighter, you're talking 150 to 200 hours. So. Still go ahead and operate the fire department. And you can be in training too. Yeah, you can. Again, you're going to be responding to calls without training, would be the only issue. They're training, they've had it, so they've got some kind of knowledge, haven't they? Yeah, those, those two or three, yes. Yeah. But everybody else, no. How many departments have got more than two or three that's got some training? You can look at that document that he's talking about, and it'll show you that. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? There's no no uh, timetable on what when it's going to happen, or how long it's going to be, or two to four weeks, six months, or what? Does anybody have any idea how it's going? How long it's going to take? Uh, I, again, I don't know. I would. I think that the number that was quoted by Chief Clark to Chief Grubb was two to six weeks. So again, they've got to have that organizational meeting to, in effect, pass the baton to the new group, uh, vote them in, um, and then an audit needs to be done. Now, I guess it will be up to those new members of that department as to how strict of an audit they want. I suppose they could waive the audit if they wanted to, you know, sign a statement relieving former members and the chief of any uh, of any liability. Again, we don't have control over that, right. but that's that is one possibility that I talked to uh, Chief Grubb about that they could consider at that first meeting to speed things up. So again, I'm I'm just yeah. quoting what right. was. So it'll be by Chief Clark two to six weeks. So be Chief Clark have his meeting, then everything going. Then the new people can take and start from right then after that. There again, that's 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 only my speculation. You nor I set that, right. you know, set that agenda. But that that's my hope, and I and I I certainly want it to be up and running as quickly as anybody in this audience does. All right. Chief, thank you very much. A lot of information here, again, available to anybody that wants to see it. Um, let's see here. That was not an action item. Uh, and we'll have Chief back here probably in August to do the same kind of thing, and we'll do it every couple of months thereafter. All right, update time on number seven update on repairs and improvements to the Justice Center including scope of work with possible action that's kind of a repeat but uh, this is an important topic and so we'll update you every time that we have a meeting and Steve is here again yes right there in the middle to uh, thanks everybody and Steve can uh, update us as much as or more than I can but here's here's what I know since the last meeting with the help of Glenn Calvert and Wade Clark we got the bid package uh, published it's been advertised in our newspaper uh, well you've got the paper edition on the weekend I know it made it in there I think both of the last Saturdays and then it's in the midweek edition, which is an online edition, so it's been available there. I know that uh, Wade Clark has shown the building to one of the local contractors that was not able to be there on the open house day that's coming up. Is that today or is that? Well, it's not. It doesn't really have anything to do with you. It's just the day that uh, the guys from Prefort are going to be available there if there are any contractors that want to walk the building and get a hands-on view of what the building needs. So one has already looked. Uh, I have been contacted by another one, by two more, and I referred uh, Wade Clark to send them a complete bid packet, which he did. So that's, and then on the 24th of this month is when bids are due. I believe it's the 24th. It's sometime before our next commissioner's court meeting. 
So that's when the bids are due in and hopefully very quickly we can either at the regular court meeting or at a special call meeting uh, vote to approve those bids. And as a reminder, those bid packages are asking for not only dollar figures by that contractor, but what is their time frame so that we can decide, okay, we have a lower bid here, but it's going to take six months, and we have a higher bid that's going to take three months, then it'll be up to us to decide how much more are we willing to spend to get a faster turnaround. I've talked to Brett, what's Brett's last name? Brett Anderson with Texas Association of Counties. We've been kind of wondering when are we going to get that final figure that TAC will write us a check for to cover the loss over there. And unlike what some of us are used to where they come and assess the damage and they say, okay, here's what we're going to give you, here's a check, and if it ends up costing you more, let us know and we'll figure out if those additional costs are warranted and we'll give you additional money. Brett Anderson and TAC are not going to do it that way. They are going to rely heavily on what the bid process produces in the way of costs to make those repairs. And we know that there are costs that are going to be associated with just the repair of what was damaged, and there are going to be expenses related to the enhancements that we together have said we are willing to spend more than just repairing the damage to the building because it's a good opportunity to update that building. There will be some coverage in that insurance reimbursement, according to Brett, that will help us with the expenses we've incurred utilizing Prefert uh, for both the bid package, the engineering expertise, and then the uh, hourly support that they're going to give us to oversee the contractor and the work that they do once we, once we eventually get started. So as far as I know, I don't have any more details than that to give you other than to say we have got uh, the public knows about the bid package, um, the ones that, you know, are going to be interested. Hopefully they are bondable and hopefully they will give us a good price and a good time frame in order to do that in and so we're in that time frame right now where we're waiting on contractors to consider uh, their participation and their costs and to put together their bids which will uh, be finalized here at that bid turn in date and i think it's do you know what it is is it monday the 21st do you happen to know i'm on it maybe it's monday the 21st Maybe it's the eighth. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, hopefully here by the end of the month we are awarding a uh, bid to someone and Wade Clark asked me, he said one of the contractors has asked him how quickly can we start after the bid is accepted and I told him we want to start as soon as we possibly can. We want to get their bonds in, their proof of insurance in, so whatever administrative items need to be taken care of before they hit the ground running in that building, you know, let's shorten that. We don't have to wait 30 days or two weeks or one week, whatever we can do to get the work started as quickly as possible. That's all I know. Do you want to add to that or ask me anything? The, uh, this past week, uh, Mr. Anderson uh, asked Kirk Grisham, the adjuster, to come down and survey actually in the state. He did P and I met over there, he did a survey basically to, to look at what they did. And Interstate's the company that did the remediation work. They cleaned up the building, they removed the sheetrock and the mold and dried the building out where it passed inspection and it's mold free. Correct. And uh, any anything else that, that he saw
Okay. 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 All right. Questions, commissioners? Okay, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no action on item number seven. That was just an update. Item number eight discuss providing a loan to Five Star Volunteer Fire Department for a tanker truck to be reimbursed by Texas Forestry Service within three months. I think we have a, I'll let Commissioner Fitch explain this. We have a situation where we've gotten a, a grant, and that's good news, but this grant's a little bit different, and instead of paying us or paying that VFD up front, uh, they may, have to come up with some funds before they are reimbursed for the purchase. All right, Mark, will you come up and help me? Mark Williams with Five Star. Um, we're not sure if we've done this before, uh, loan this much money for a temporary time, but uh, actually it's a guaranteed <clears throat> by the letter from the Forestry Service that they got the $220,000 grant and Mark, explain some numbers on that truck, and then uh, also understand it's ready to be picked up Thursday. Should be ready. So, I mean, it's time to act on this. Okay, tell us what all we need uh, to do. We, we come to the court several months ago and explained to them we had got the grant for $220,000. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, the county paid 10%, I believe, on mm -hmm. those. Uh, Sorry, I didn't bring it. But the truck totaled out at two hundred and fifty-five thousand, I think. Uh, of course, there was some different equipment that had to go on that truck to make it more useful for us air pack holders, uh, scene lights, stuff like that. Except this vehicle will be used for more than just tankers; it'll be used for uh, car fires or air fires, out car fire response vehicle. Uh, well, right now, our air packs are in boxes or bags behind the seat of the truck, so they can be more like Mount Pleasant when we get on the scene. We can grab the air pack, on the air pack, don't have to mess with getting out of the box, put it all together. Uh, we went ahead and had that set up for five of those. Uh, the grants for $220,000, uh, the county's already approved to pay the 10%. Can I stop you there a second? What's <clears throat> The 220 is the net grant, or we have to kick in 10% of that 220. The we kick in to you'll give 10% that you've already voted to do. Which is how much? I think we did it. 22. In Was it 25? I thought we yeah, did the 10%. The, we brought an estimate mm -hmm. several months ago, and I'm pretty sure the truck was 255,000 out the door. And so they'll give us 90% of that figure, or they've already told you this is the figure we'll give you. If it costs you more, that's tough luck. The $220,000, which is guaranteed in the letter, uh, Commissioner Fitch has a copy of it if you want to look. I have a copy as well. I can get you more copies. Uh, that's what the Texas A&M Forestry Service will pay the county back, is the $220,000. That we have to pay for the truck get the truck in our possession, the Forestry Service sends an inspector out to inspect the truck, and once the truck's inspected and signed off by that inspector, then they'll release the funds to the county. Uh, in the past, we went and got bank loans and paid the interest on those for 90 days. Uh, talked to a couple of y'all, judge, division officers, the county may be willing to do this for us so we don't incur the cost. What you got to remember is this is a Titus County truck. When it gets here, it stays in Titus County. Just like what we're going through with Sugar here right now. All those trucks stay in the county. And in the event that something were to happen to Five Star, you're still going to have a $255,000 truck, not counting the loan, which your county is going to get for about $25,000. Answer me this. The truck you said is going to cost about 255000 Yes, sir. 
and 220 is the amount of the grant. That's a $35,000 shortfall. We've approved 25. Where does the other 10 come from? The rest of that comes out of our department fund. Okay. That we have, you know, that's what we have to do. Yes, we'd love the county to pay all that, but we want to do our part and, you know, take responsibility for it. It's our truck. You, you want to customize ability? it some too, so that's good, you know, just like you want it. So. Do you have the ability to come up with that, or are you going to have to take out a loan for that? We have the money in our account. If we can get the 220000 for the loan plus the 25000 approved, we have the money in our account to finish paying for the truck. Uh, talking to them, the dealer, as soon as I can, if I can, I don't know how I'm paying. We get this, we transfer the money, it actually goes through a Kenworth dealer in Dallas. Uh, we will pay them and we get all that done. The last word I got as of over the weekend, sometimes I got pictures. We're still set to go to pick this truck up Friday morning. And of course, it will take probably two weeks for them to come and inspect it. I don't know how long that process will take. I don't know. I've never been through that. Once I inspect it, uh, then they'll turn it in and getting it rigged out and ready to go, I'd say probably a month that truck would be in service. At that point, uh, the plan is still to send the larger tanker that we have right now to Argo, who at this point I don't think has a tanker at all. There's, their old one is just completely out of service, should have been out of service probably 10 years ago. It <coughs> bit the dust. So right now Argo does not have a tanker, so this tanker is going to that location, so they'll have to do yeah. But essence, you're going to get it. The county's going to receive a truck that's going to really, when it's all said and done, other than the loan cost the county about $25,000 for a $255,000 piece of equipment. And the delay in getting that money, that's just part of the process. And what, what do we have to give to the state? to get them to write that $220,000 check? Does it have to be inspected and approved? And what other steps do you have to go through? Uh, the inspection process and getting it approved, it, I mean, it, it's already approved. They just have to inspect and say it meets their requirements. Once they say it meets their requirements, he signs off on it. And then it's just the time to get the paperwork through them. I don't know how long that's going to take. Uh, I've heard. Uh, 60 to 90 days. That's why we put it on a 90 day deal. We don't see any reason for it to take them over 90, is what they're telling us. All right. Anything else? Another thing, I was talking to Barbara on this. It needs to be done by the 1st of September for our budget year or something. Explain that. There's, that's why I said 90 days. I mean, we. If this waits any longer, we can't do it. So. Well, well, we can do it. But what I suggested to you is we, if we do it by September 30th, it won't hit our financial statements because that's the as of date of our financial statements. If we don't do that, well, then we're going to need to show you know, an accounts receivable from the Texas Forest Service. If we do that, the authors are going to need proof of all that. They're going to need you know, copies of inspections and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But if we get it settled and the money back to us before September 30th, then our outside auditors won't need that information. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, it, it's good timing. And, and we're hoping this 90 days is plenty of time to get it done. So. Well, have y'all tried to get a loan yet? <clears throat> have y'all tried to get a loan yet? No, sir, we haven't. We were, you know, hoping we could do it this way so we don't incur the extra cost of the interest. Well, we've done it in the past. Y'all got loans. We just done the, what, 10% you say? or? The counties always give 10% on any of those large purchases that we've been granted for. Have you ever done any on anything small, like a 10000 loan or anything, Commissioner Parker? Do you remember oh. any, any time that we've given a loan to a fire department? So now, uh, this is, the, this is new. Most of the time in the past that I recall, uh, the uh, Commissioners have, have taken care of the, uh, or the, the county has taken care of the 10%. The mm -hmm. uh, I cannot remember any time, I mean, we've made some smaller, small loans and all. I think the last one, 
Sugar Hill. I can't remember who it was. The Sugar we, Hill on the building. We did do. Huh? Was the Sugar Hill on the building? They rigged out a grass truck for 3500 or something one time. Seemed like it, it wasn't it, a whole uh, lot. We have loaned, loaned the money and, and uh, yeah. uh, then been able to, mm -hmm. you know, the, they would give it back to the, to the county. My thinking behind it is the county helping something that's good for the county, and it's not going to cost us anything, but loan the money, get our money back. So that's where I stood on it. So, well, it'll cost right. us less than a percentage point if we pull it out of something that might otherwise be earning interest for mm -hmm. us, but it'll save them probably four percent for that period of time. We we have not, in my tenure, done a loan of this size or mm -hmm. anywhere close to that. Mm -hmm. So. You know the pros and cons here it's an awful lot of money are we setting a precedent here where other departments are going to ask for this whether it's fire department or any other department or a commissioner or something like that um, i don't think there's any concern in getting our money back here but you know nothing is guaranteed so are you comfortable? Are you comfortable making a loan of this size for a period of this length of time? Um, and do you want to set a deadline on that of September 30th so that we can achieve what Barbara's talking about, not having this receivable on our balance sheet at the end of the mm -hmm. year? I think that that's important. Mm -hmm. um, Are we going to lose a percentage of some taking money out of our savings to do this, Barbara? So I didn't take that in consideration, so that's, that's not a good thing. We're earning interest on all of our money. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we do this, we won't earn that. Mm -hmm. But the spread is something like what Judge Lee said. We're earning 1% and if they go to get a loan, it's going to be you know, at least 2 maybe 4%. Mm -hmm. I think you're talking I about we then. I want to caution you. You're yeah. setting a precedent. It's a pretty big loan. For the future. And, and, you know, it, it sounds to me like Mr. Williams has done all the work. Sounds like it's okay, and this one sounds good, but the next one may not be. Mm -hmm. Those grants have so many strings, so many strings attached. So I just want to caution you about setting that precedent. You just need to know and be considerate of what you're doing if you decide to Okay. What if we uh, we could maybe say uh, we could give you this loan if you can't get one at a bank first, and that would cover us. I mean, so you could get your truck. If somebody won't help you, be willing to help you get your loan. I mean, that's probably where this is going. Well, what's your What's your logic so, there? What, uh, just to help them get it if a bank won't give them a loan. Well, but what's, what's your logic of, of I'm afraid uh, to go get a bank loan first? Cause taking the responsibility for it with this losing the interest. I don't like that idea of it. <clears throat> what do you guys eight, think about, about it? Eight hundred dollars worth. Eight hundred dollars. What do you guys think about it? No, it won't be that. Anybody much. else? I think we need to table it and let them uh, try to get their loan first. And like I said, if they can't, we can step in and consider it. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you table it, I can tell you the truck won't be in service that soon. Just for the simple fact that the people that have to get the loan, on, which is Kirk and them, aren't in town. Uh, they won't be back till next week. So they're going to push it out trying to get that. I would say if the commissioners are worried about the $800, it would be cheaper on us as five star to pay the $800 and then to pay the them. We might be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Pay half of it so the county don't lose all of it. We just, we'd like to get the truck in service as soon as possible so we can get a truck ready to get our little truck. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, you know, if we didn't have the grant for $225,000, we'd be standing here looking at y'all for $255,000 saying, we need a new truck, or Argo's going to be standing here going, we got to buy a truck, it's going to cost the county $255,000. What are we do? You know, we've done our, you know, we try to get the grants, and I believe we've got grants several times. This is just the first time we, you know, asked for the money to get it to where we get it reimbursed. I can go either. Way. I can go either way on this, as far as mm -hmm. setting a precedent. That, just because I do this doesn't mean I have to do it the next time. This one, 
make sense here for several reasons. It is a lot of money. It is out of the norm of what we do. It'll cost us about $800. They can possibly cover that. We're giving them $25,000 anyway. Is it a problem to give them $25,800? I can go either way on this, guys. Well, I think it's a good deal. I think it's a pretty well guaranteed deal. I'm super stoked about the $255,000 truck. Uh, that sets a president right there for me. So uh, I, I'd like to just go ahead and make a motion that we we give them the loan for 90 days. How about you say it, it must be paid back on or before September 30th? Yeah, on or before and September if, 30th. If, if not, you'll have to go to a bank. You know. You see a problem there on September <clears> 1? We'll be looking to you to get a quick bank loan to get us out of that because not that it would kill our audit or anything like that, but I'd rather not have that receivable on, on our end of the financials. We'd be willing to do this. Okay, you want to pay the interest cost, Commissioner Fitch? Uh, yeah, we'll do the, the make it 25, down. 8, 25, 7, whatever it's going to be. Yeah. It'll just be lost opportunity for the county or there won't be a bill for that. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Fitch to make a loan in the amount of two hundred and twenty thousand dollars over and above our twenty five thousand dollar contribution to five star to be paid back on or before September 30, 2021. I'll second it. <clears throat> second by Commissioner Parker. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. One opposed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hopefully, and you know, once you spend that money, let's get that money back from the state as quickly as we possibly can, so that we don't run into a jam in September. As soon as I make possession, probably there'll be no divide, yeah. and we'll start setting up the yeah. process. Again. Yeah. Let us know when you actually make the transfer of truck for cash. So, Cheryl, would this be in a check? With batches, do you need more paperwork to know what to write five star a check for? And we'll probably be pushing it by Friday. Well, <coughs> we're going to need a copy of that letter that you have from the Forest Service. Uh -huh. And Judge Lee, do we need some something signed, some note or something that John Mark's going to have to? I mean, I, I don't know that we need anything that fancy. I just think we have, uh, you know, a memo is is adequate for me. Okay, so so you we prepare that memo then, and then get a signature from yep. from Five Star, and, yep. then, and then with that, then at that point I will approve that, mm -hmm. and then it will be, you know, whenever Miss Pretty has an opportunity to to do okay. that, that check. Maybe we can yeah, try I'll, to get I'll email something Friday. for your approval. Okay. I'll email it okay. to Mark. Because I didn't understand that process. So we'll be calling and trying to get it going. The soon and the quicker you can give us, you know, an exact <clears throat> dollar figure as to what we're going to need. I assume you're going to come up with the pennies and dollars that are off from these big dollars we're talking yes, about. We'll, we'll give you the 25000 plus the 220000 Yes, sir. And we'll, we've already got it right. Thanks since we get back to the they'll get it wired over to the Kenworth place in okay. Dallas, and then we can pick the truck up at that point. Okay. Very good. Thank, thank you. All. all right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Gary, am I doing you a favor if I bump you up and let you get back to work? Yes. All right, I'm going to jump down to item number 12. We've got a uh, presentation, various items, the same type of items we've discussed before. We've got Gary Luba here from H.W. Lochner and just keeping us updated and asking for necessary signatures to approve these uh, uh, appraisals that have been done on these mm, 33 some odd uh, individual parcels related to acquisition of right-of-way on FM 1735. And so no new earth-shattering news today, just letting us know we've knocked out a few more appraisals. Uh, you've been able to talk to a few more landowners and hopefully have those negotiations in process. So what do you have to tell us and what do you need approval for? Okay, uh, let me give you just a little quick update on where we are. We well, there's 32 parcels. We've made 18 offers, so we'll have about 
five more to make this week. And then after we get these four approved that are on today, we'll, we'll make those. So we'll have about everything named this month except for those parcel 10 and 12, which is they're still working on those survey issues. Uh, Tech dot still working on yes. them. Yeah. So it looks like they're, I asked the district surveyor where they were on that. And it looks like they're, they're getting a lot closer. So hopefully, maybe by the end of the month, you know, it'll happen to us. And we can finish those the right here. Uh, got, so far, I've got about, I think, three or four acceptances. I, I expect some more. Uh, so anyway, it, it's, it's off and running. So, uh, hey, Gary. Four appraisals that I have. Gary, Commissioner Parker's how, got a question. How long yeah. does it do they have to make the offer on? Uh, I mean, to accept the, the uh, offer. Well, I mean, it's it's something just to keep the process moving. We put in the offer letter like 30 days from the time they receive it. But if we see that they are working with us, and they're not just driving the feed or anything like that. We won't find a offer yet, you know. But if we have to find a offer. That gives an extra like 14 days. Okay. So, but so far, I mean, everything is, is going pretty good to start off. With. So, it's just I think it makes a big difference on the appraiser that we chose for the good solid appraisals. And if they are real good, then you got a lot more chance of people accepting. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the four half a day. <coughs> We got parcel three, which is on State Highway 49 there by the corner store, and that's where the, the fireworks stand is. So that's not a very large parcel, it's 0.079 of an acre. So the total amount is based on, well, it's 17,000 there just because you're you're near a corner on State Highway 49 and 1735. But since the parcel is so small, it's like $822. And that's it, no, no cost to cure anything, no improvements, it's just like the plan. Okay. okay. What was the 17,000? Yeah, it's called a zone corner. You're close what was the 800 and what was the 17,000? Oh, the 17,000 is a per, per acre uh, back. Per acre. That's what, that's what the 822 is based off of. So like 1079, 1017,000 from the 822. So less than a tenth of that, okay. Yes, sir, right. Okay, the next one is the corner store. Uh, let's see, the acres there, it's not very large either. It's like 0.075 of an acre. But we have, uh, you know, that's based on probably about the same per acre value of things. Let's see. No, actually it's more because you, you've got that hard corner. So that's based on 33,000 per acre. Uh, anyway, but, but the parcel is small, 0.075 of an acre. So the land value there is 2,475. And then you've got the improvement value of 24,024. And what that entails is uh, a concrete paving. You got one, two, three, three on premise signs and one exterior light. And then you got you got a metal pipe that's a former sign pole. So all those together is twenty four thousand oh two four. There's some cost secure uh, on that for five thousand three hundred and fifty for a total value of 31849 Okay, the next one is parcel five, and that's also running uh, State Highway 49 there, so it's, it's I, I believe, our largest parcel on the project, and that is, uh, the acreage is 4.443. So uh, the land value there, Thirty-four thousand six fifty-five. It's just vacant land, so there's no cost secure, no no improvements. And that one, because it's larger, it's on the corner of it, but because it's larger acreage, is seventy-eight hundred per acre. 
so the larger of acreage is you typically the lower the per acre back but when you got a kind of like a almost a pad site like a corner store then that's going to be higher okay so so the total value is thirty four thousand six fifty five no improve, any improvements no sir now there's uh you know it's been too wet to cut hay you know here lately but i know they have a tenant farmer that builds hay so that's going to be a a loss there i don't i don't know if they're gonna if they're gonna say anything about that they mention it but i guess you only typically you know, i'm not a farmer but only typically cut hay about twice a year is that right and so they haven't been able to cut so we can have this purchase you know before like september i guess maybe the next time and you know maybe there won't be any crop loss you know planes or anything like that but uh i have no idea what that would be but the appraiser did not did not figure anything like that in with the offer okay our last one is parcel eight and that is uh 0.981 of an acre uh so basically that is uh the land value seven thousand three fifty eight so you got an improvement value of seven thousand eight seventy nine which includes a metal panel gate uh drive area gravel paving concrete paving so they've got a septic system there too uh and some landscaping so seven thousand eight seventy nine but there's going to be some uh cost secure damages there of seventeen thousand nine fifty and i think that primarily has to do uh, with the septic system you know they're probably going to reestablish it it's going to it's going to reduce the remainder so just the Reestablishment. I think it, I think the right of the line, if I remember right, it gets into the uh, to the, their spray field or whatever, and uh, so that's got to be you know find another location and get that re reinstalled. Uh, so that's the last one. Uh, any questions for me? I have none, commissioners. No, I don't have anything else. But. I'm grateful to be working with you guys, and like I said, it's off to a good start. It's going to be pretty busy, you know, getting, when we get all these offers out. So, uh, so I'll be up here. <laughs> all right. So today we just need to approve those four appraisals. Yes, yes. Get a signature. Is that it for today? Yes, sir. All right. So I think that about gets everything except for. 10 and 12 which come like Okay. So this will become the last one. Commissioner, we're ready to make a motion for that to approve these appraisals presented today uh, with county signature. <coughs> make motion we approve them. Motion Commissioner Parker. Second. Second, Second Commissioner Applewhite. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, I'll sign if you're ready. By, by the way, uh, uh, the title work we got about everything now, so they'll hold off on 10 and 12 until we, yeah, you know, get that ironed out. Okay. Yeah. So, Homeland got it, got you all but those last two. Yes. Good, yeah, okay. We've got about 3.65 million in our right of way utility fund uh, as per your most recent cash report. So, <clears throat> keeping you all up to date on that.
Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Yes, sir. We'll see you next time, perhaps. Good see. All right, that completes oh, item number 12. <laughs> Thank Let's you, go backwards you, to item number nine, and Commissioner Fitch is going to tell us about some repairs that we think we need on the south end courthouse steps by Mobile Enterprises, who uh, has done previous work for us. We have um, two steps on the south side courthouse steps that have that uh, rubber coating with the grip uh, sand or whatever's in it you know, for protection of those concrete steps. And uh, possibly during the ice freeze, there must have been a pinhole or a crack, and it swelled up with some moisture, and it's split about a foot long on one step and two or three inches on this other step. It's got two big bubbles in it. So I called the company that did those stairs, and they checked with the supplier of the product that 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 rubber coating is about an eighth inch thick and it's not under warranty it was a like a one-year warranty against cracking or pinhole or leak or something um i guess that's what it was a year so mobile enterprises says they will warrant it and buy the materials to fix the step they just ask that we pay a, a travel fee down here for a couple of their employees and their trucks and them come down here and back and a fee of $500 is what that costs for their travel. So uh, I make a motion that uh, we get it repaired by Mobile Enterprises and I, I'll contact them and tell them to order their materials and come repair that. We inspected all the other stairs and they look really good. So um, just something unfortunately didn't get, wasn't perfectly fixed or something. I don't know what caused it, so. Well, that's the longest we've gone without having damage to those steps. I think all in all, it was a good solid seal. I'm glad that yeah, they're willing good to, to cover this uh, outside of the warranty. I think it's important we get that fixed. Once it, once it starts, we don't want that split to continue. So I, uh, if you've got a motion. Make a motion that. that we have mobile enterprises come and repair at a cost of $500. Second. Second by Commissioner <clears throat> Parker. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Item number 10, consider and possibly approve an interlocal agreement between Camp and Titus Counties regarding funding for the Office of District Attorney with possible action to follow. This is uh, an, an agreement that we talked about last uh, time we were working on the budget in anticipation of the changeover of DAs and we worked out an arrangement with uh, Camp County. This particular amendment to the existing interlocal agreement gives some flexibility to us that uh, let, let me read some of the basics of this first of all. The Camp County and Titus entered into an interlocal agreement uh, and agreed to cooperate in the funding of the district attorney's office. District attorney provides services in both those counties and obviously there's a differential based on the size of the county. Number one, employees of the district attorney's office are employees of Titus County. Titus County will manage the disbursement of salaries, withholding health insurance, retirement, and other f financial matters. Camp County has agreed to contribute $50,000. we are making a slight change of wording and we're going to say contribute up to $50,000. And that way, if they don't spend uh, the entire amount of money that was anticipated to be spent, then we can ratchet that back down and keep that ratio between the two counties uh, appropriate. Instead of requiring them to contribute a full $50,000, their fair share may be less than that $50,000. Staff expenses under this agreement will include employee costs as well as non-employee contract, contract expenditures including but not limited to payment for work on appeals, grand jury preparation, and temporary employment whether paid as employees or contract labor. 
in other words, uh, DA Colley has the ability to uh, employ just on a contractual basis uh, other attorneys or uh, legal support staff that may not become employees of the county. It may be a, just a quick project where he asks for somebody to do a brief or something like that for him. Uh, the portion of funds requested from Camp County will be about thir will be 30 percent of the total uh, re expenses, and this is based on a 30-70 Camp Titus split. In order to accomplish that proportional contribution detailed in, in number five that I just read, the county may draw from overpayments made by Camp County and may also adjust the monthly billing to Camp County to first use excess funds already paid or to include additional expenses incurred that month. Barbara, I guess it was you probably came up with this wording on this re revision or you expressed that to David and he came up with the wording revisions. Okay, so the, the same basic idea is in effect here, splitting these expenses between uh, these two counties for DA uh, manpower. But we do need to approve this since there is a change here and it does need to be updated. So I would like for you to approve this first amended interlocal agreement. Barbara, is there any comment you had? Okay. Make a motion, we approve it have a motion second. and a second by Commissioner Parker. All in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Uh, just an update from D.A. Colley. He thinks he's a week or so away from moving into his new offices. We certainly hope. But big news, he has found and hired an assistant D.A. She is a prosecutor in Denton County and she'll start July 2nd and uh, bringing her husband with her, and I think they're gonna live, I can't remember if he said in, in, uh, in, in Pittsburgh or not, but he's excited to have found her. He did not know her. He found her through the search process, but his assistant DA has been hired. Awesome. Okay. Let me also read you some comments. David was uh, selecting a jury today or he would have been here. Uh, the reason we're, we amended this interlocal agreement is to make it clear that if my office is not operating with a full staff, as it has not been up to this point, then Titus can bill Camp County for their portion in a lesser amount in order to keep that 30-70 split. To clarify, if I hire someone as contract labor for a particular project, such as certain cases for grand jury or drafting an appeal, then that counts as something Camp County will also contribute to, proportion, to proportionally and not just be limited to actual county employees. Should have read that to you before, but that's from DA Colley. Item number 10, consider and possibly accept the donation of a flag disposal receptacle from American National Bank of Mount Pleasant. And Commissioner Fitch, tell us about how this came to pass. All right, um, if you've ever noticed our flag receptacle out by our war memorial, uh, it's needing some new lettering, new painting, a new finish on it, it's getting a little rusty. So David uh, Holmes brought to my attention. We were looking at the project, trying to get a hold of the company, if we can get it redone. That company went out of business since then. And uh, I noticed it had the American National Bank on it as a sponsor who bought it. So I went and I thought, we'll ask American National Bank what they think about it. And so they decided they would give us a donation to buy us a brand new flag disposal receptacle. And I don't know if you can see that very well, but it, uh, this will go on the record. It, it looks like a mailbox, a large mailbox, like you drop your letters in at the fire, at the post office. And it's wrapped in the American flag. And it'll also have American National Bank donated uh, a little sign printed on there. We'll have to get that uh, drawn up. They're advertising on there that they're donating. This flag receptacle box, this one will hold uh, Probably three times the flags this box out here does. It holds 10 or 15. This one's going to hold 30 to 50, uh, which is it's good when it's, it gets really full. It's hard. This will be easier to put flags in it. And then we'll dispose of them properly. 
Um, so the total cost was $1,739, and American National Bank agreed they will write a check for this, this to the county as a donation, and we will order it, and then the warranty on the, it's a stainless steel bin, it has a warranty on the finish, uh, I think mean one year warranty on parts, hinges, or whatever, and they'll warranty that to the county, and then I can install it, I'll put it together and install it, they're going to ship it to the maintenance barn out here, uh, either put together or we put it together, and then uh, I'm going to get a foundation fix for it so it'll be mounted real proper and we'll have us a little ceremony when we dedicate it so it takes about six eight weeks to get one of these in so i just wanted to uh make a motion that we accept uh, the donation from american national bank uh, for them buying a new flag disposal receptacle the cost of that little pad uh, I'll do that res expenses out of my pocket personally. I have some friends I discussed it with. Uh, some of my friends from Georgia that are in the granite business, and they decided, Fitch, we'll get you a piece of granite to set it on. Uh, we, we mounted that uh, Blue Star Memorial right across from it uh, on a piece of granite, and uh, it looks really nice. And so this will look real nice, and I'll concrete that to the ground. So. It looked nice, so we got that covered too, so no problem. All right, well, thank you for overseeing that and getting that donation for us. Uh, motion to accept this uh, kind offer from American National Bank of Mount Pleasant. Motion. motion, Commissioner Parchman. Second. Second, Commissioner Parker. All in favor? Say aye. 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 <clears throat> Item number 13. Consider and possibly approve the renewal of a memorandum of understanding between the county and Health and Human Services Commission for the lease of the building at 303 East 11th in Mount Pleasant. It's just time to renew that MOU that we have with Health and Human Services. We have a county-owned building there at 303 East 11th that we allow them to use. Uh, I recommend that we continue to allow them to use that. Uh, just remember that any and all expenses related to repairs, whether major or minor on that building, they have always stepped up and uh, paid for. They ask permission each time, uh, but they've done things like replacing air conditioners and paint work, and uh, they keep the building up to date and current and uh, properly functional. So I see no reason not to continue to allow them to do that make a motion we approve the renewal second motion and a second by commissioner parchman any discussion or question on that all in favor say aye aye, aye. <laughs> going to sign this Item number 14, consider and possibly nominate two members to the Board of Directors for the Northeast Texas Housing Finance Corporation. Well, here's one of these. You learn something new every day. I wasn't aware we had two members of that board, but we do. Unfortunately, one has retired and one has passed away. Dear Judge Lee, this is from Richard Anderson in Marshall, Texas. Just a just FYI, Richard Anderson was the uh, gentleman that was defeated by Senator Ratliff back in 1988. He's still alive and well there in Marshall. And dear Judge Lee, the Northeast Texas Housing Finance Corporation was created in 92 in order to attempt to address the issue of low and moderate housing within the Arctex Council of Government's jurisdiction. Corporation's jurisdiction is coextensive 
with that of the COG. In the past, the corporation has issued single-family mortgage and revenue bonds and also assisted with multifamily housing projects within the jurisdiction. It stands to assist with these types of programs when it is approached by interested developers or financial entities. Pursuant to the Articles of Incorporation, each participant county is entitled to appoint two members of the board which are appointed by Commissioner's Court of each county. Our records reflect those two current members are the Honorable Sam Russell and Commissioner Mike Fields. So we need to update those. Uh, I don't know if and when we'll be called upon to participate in decision making, but let's at least get some current names and I'm willing to serve on that, at least have my name uh, listed properly there. And we need, I think, uh, one other commissioner who might be willing to have their name on there. Obviously, it's not a big time uh, consuming appointment in that I've never even uh, been approached by this entity. Looks good on your resume. Who wants to do it? <laughs> Maybe our senior commissioner. Our senior commissioner at the end, maybe, do that down there. <laughs> no, I, I getting the stink eye from that direction, and my ears are turning red. So. It sounds like a rookie assignment to me. A rookie. <laughs> you need to get something on the books for you, man. It's your turn. Make a motion. I make a motion we uh, nominate Jeff Parchman. As well as? And Judge Brian Lee. All right, I'm honored, honored to serve. <laughs> All right, that's our motion, is uh, to appoint two names to replace Judge Russell, Commissioner Fields, <laughs> here for the Northeast Texas Housing Finance Corporation board membership. Got a motion. Second. Second by Ooh, Commissioner Applewhite. Fast. Well, you were, that was you're on time. the ball. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. Aye. <laughs> My hair blew by when you said it that fast. <laughs> wind in here. <laughs> okay. You'd have to help me figure out how to get that back to them. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm so glad we did this last year. Item number 15, consider and possibly approve the extension of bids that we received back in June a year ago pertaining to the following items. HVAC, heating and air conditioning uh, maintenance, lawn maintenance, fuel, road materials, culverts, and road oil. As you'll recall, that used to take up half of a day as we worked through all of those bids. And Barbara, if Barbara hadn't done anything, she did this for us and got us to approve a three-year deal if that supplier is willing to continue to honor that. So this is from uh, Barbara, and listen carefully. The terms and conditions of the bids that were approved last year include an optional two-year extension. Commissioners would need to approve now a one-year extension. At that time, I will then send a letter to each vendor notifying them of this extension and offering them an opportunity to reject the extension. The letter will also state that the second extension will be considered next year to make up the full run of three. But last year, they were all informed of this, that this would be a possibility. So it's kind of a two-edged sword. Either you're locked in for three years, or if you see that as a, a good opportunity that you can count on having that business from the county for three years. So if you're comfortable with that, if there's anybody uh, that you know you're doing business with that you want to uh, consider not renewing for another year, this is your opportunity to do that. Otherwise, it's your opportunity to grant an extension of those bids from last year and then Barbara will get a reciprocal response from that supplier ensuring that they're willing to continue on at that same price. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, does, if they don't accept it for another year, then the way things are going up, who knows what, you know, what well, then we'll have to go through the bid process on it? That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. 
Now, the one that I think would, would fluctuate the most would probably be your, your fuel prices. And of course, they're tied to a standard anyway. It doesn't mean that they're, they have a fixed dollar amount. But somebody like who's doing our lawn maintenance, you know, they may not be willing to continue at that price. So we do have that possibility that we'll be back uh, rebidding this. But if you're okay with extension on all of those items. I got a, a guy out of the day, Okay. So I'd like to get that. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I can't believe they delivered to our yard at $42 a yard. Can we pick it up and cook it? Uh, let's, let's not divulge those prices. Sir. We may not want to divulge those prices if we're going to do a bid. So we would like to rebid iron ore. Any anything else on that list? Barbara, okay. did we didn't we get a letter from uh, waste management about the uh, flex base at the power plant? We, did. we got a letter from waste management. But I mean, they're the only ones that ever bid have ever bid it, as far as I know, anyway. So. So it'll be what it is. It's going to go up anyway. Mm -hmm. I think P gravel's going up too. We would send this when I send this letter out, we'll know whether or not they're gonna yeah. be on these. Yeah, we may have to rebid several of those gravels. There was one question that came to me about the uh lawn maintenance. Mm -hmm. Um the question that I got was whether or not the uh, sprinkler system was in there and, and when I read this, this is what it says contractor agrees to perform services outline and agrees to repair a contractor's expense damage caused by the contractor to build in our sprinkler system. So mm -hmm. I don't know if we've had some damage that he didn't cause and that he didn't want to fix that. I don't know. No. Where no. no, I just wanna make sure I just wanna make sure, you know, crank that sprinkler system up this year and get it checked out, make sure it's working. So he's capable of fixing it and he has Yeah. So yeah, yeah he causes the damage. Which actually, he is not a licensed sprinkler guy. Okay. So he, has he gets to, somebody he licensed. Gets somebody. David, tell me something about a license. I, now, I thought he had we had Stanley one. working for us, uh -huh. Stanley was a licensed irrigation contractor, and he mm -hmm. was able to take care of that. We have a different scenario here. That's one of the things that we lost when we went with uh, Dufresne. Yeah, ROK -okay Enterprises. Okay, well anyway, back to the major point. Three inch limestone as well. I, I'm sorry, this air on, I can't hear you. Three inch limestone. Have we got an issue with that? You want to re you want to rebid that? <clears throat> well, it, it wasn't bid. Like that was that the smaller stuff was we didn't bid the three inch and we yeah. got an issue on this. I, I didn't find where the county had bid it in the past, so I didn't bid it last last year either. Okay. So three inch limestone in our Okay, so again, we may have several that will not just perfectly flow into a second year, and if so, we'll deal with that. But for those that will, are you willing to approve an extension of these bids? I'll make a motion we approve it. Motion to the extend these bids for a second year out of the three-year option periods made by Commissioner Parker. Second. Second, Commissioner Applewhite. All in favor, say aye. All right. Aye. All right. Item number 16 is our quarterly investment report. Barbara has provided that for you. And that just tells you how much money we have in each of those funds and where it is in current where it is currently invested. Uh, not a lot of significant changes there. You'll see uh, major fluctuations there in vehicle inventory tax uh, as that money is expected to be. That that fund can go 
uh, up and down depending <coughs> upon when that vehicle inventory tax comes in and when it when it is utilized when it is utilizable by the county same with tax assessor monies uh, you've got some significant fluctuations there district clerk trust funds juvenile probation but here it tells you uh, what account that is, the uh, amount that's in each of those accounts. Uh, also, as part of that report, she's given you the beginning balance uh, since the last quarter, which was year end, calendar year end, 12 31 2020. And this quarter ends March 31st. If you look there, uh, You've got this money that is uh, at Guarantee Bank. You've got your FDIC coverage at half a million dollars. You've got pledge securities that Guarantee Bank puts up to protect our investment over there. And then you've got a letter of credit of uh, $10 million. So I think as part of our agreement with Guarantee, they, they agree to go up to 20, 25 million, 30 million. And we were, uh, we were getting close to that at the end of the year when we received this uh, ARP monies, uh, which I believe we've received part of that so far. We knew that we would be pushing that $30 million uh, barrier with guarantee. And if and when that occurs, we will have a further discussion with Martin Bell at guarantee. And he has said, what will they do? Money would take. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, I think those are the high points of that investment report. Judge, I'd like to call one more thing to your attention, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the 13 week bank interest rate, which is the T bill rate, which is interest rate that was the already not much and it may get less That's fine. anyone have a question or a comment here on Barbara's investment report if not I'll entertain a motion to approve when you are ready make a motion we approve it <clears throat> motion to approve the quarterly investment report as of 331 of 21 is made by Commissioner Parker second second Commissioner Fitch all in favor say aye. 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 We'll move on down to uh, mm -hmm. item 17, approve oral and written reports of county officials provided also to you by Barbara. Make a motion. Motion to approve that is made by Commissioner Parchman. Second. Second by Commissioner Fitch. All in favor say aye. 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 your signatures on these when we finish the next one. Item number 18 is Cheryl's treasurer report for your approval. Make a motion we approve the report. Motion by Commissioner Fitch to approve the treasurer's report. Second. Second by Commissioner Parchman. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all right. All three of these investment reports the uh, uh, treasurer's report and then your departmental reports each of those need all three of them need your signature on there we'll move on to item number 19 
budget amendments. We have several here. Item 32 through 38 numbered budget amendments. And I'll go over those here in just a second. work through these. Number 32, to adjust the budget to reflect the amount of funds received from TAC. As you'll recall, TAC did uh, go ahead and advance us $40,000 and we made a $40,000 cash payment to Interstate for the remediation on the mold damage at the uh, Justice Center. That's not paying them off in full, but that was making a partial payment. And then uh, we've set up a, uh, we've pulled from county contingency $50,000 to pay the up to price for Preford Complex Designs for their engineering services related to repair and improvements at the Justice Center, along with the cost for them helping us to determine the scope of that work and to put together the bid packages. So that's up to $50,000. Uh, that we'll put into the Justice Center Repairs account. So pulling $50,000 out of contingency, we know that some of this will be eligible for reimbursement by the uh, TAC insurance, but again, we're a long ways off from making those final determinations. So let's go ahead and approve the full $50,000, which is what we know is the high end of the bid from Prefert. That was number 32. Number 33 uh, takes $2,500 out of uh, uh, annex improvements. Well, the, the work on the annex, we had nearly $400,000 budgeted there, depending upon what we were going to do with a replacement of that building, which we've put on hold, so we do have that money available. We're pulling $2,500 out of there to make uh, those repairs, as you'll recall, we had the clogged drain lines over the years that had damaged the walls, and we got uh, uh, Big Dog Construction to make those repairs, fix the walls, and add a door to that closet. Number 34 is uh, $25,000 for the to set up the appropriate accounts to reflect the donation of an F-550 truck with a thousand gallon tanker bed with a motor and pump on the back and approximately 7,000 miles. We're transferring that to precinct two. So that shows up as the receipt of a donation and then the capital outlay to provide that Tri Lakes returned tanker truck to precinct two. No impact on the budget. The second part of that item number 34 is to uh, similarly to set up the appropriate accounts to reflect the donation of a one ton 2500 truck to precinct three. So we've assigned a value of 12,500. So again, we're receiving a contribution from that VFD and we're making a distribution of that into precinct three. All of these we've discussed previously at uh, previous commissioners' meetings. Item number 35 was a request from Lou Ann Rollins with uh, the Ag Office to make a change within her budget, no new monies. She is uh, pulling some unused auto allowance monies and putting it into travel and seminars in the amount of $542. Uh, item number 36, to increase travel and seminars for training required for the new tax assessor, uh, to increase computer expense to allow the purchase of new computers for the tax office as recommended by KBRO, 
So here we are pulling some monies out of travel and, excuse me, out of other expense and office supplies where we had too much budgeted, we didn't think we needed that much, and we put 3,000 into travel and seminars and 2,000 into computer expense. Again, we've already discussed that. Item number 37, uh, this is related to the district judges. And this does get pulled out of general county contingency. So we are having to pull from that contingency balance to increase the hourly rate for court appointed attorneys in CPS cases. This is one of those we don't have a lot of control over, but those hourly fees have gone from $75 an hour to $100 an hour. And that applies only to cases after 4-1 of 21. This is per statute, and the district judges set that hourly rate. The last amendment is number 38, and we're taking $5,000 out of office expense at the sheriff's office and putting it into travel and seminars. Apparently they were a little high on office expense budget and a little low in travel and seminars, so no effect on the budget. So there is items 32 through 38. Make a motion to approve the budget amendments. Motion to approve those budget amendments. Commissioner Fitch. Second. Second, Commissioner Parchman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yeah. Opposed? Thank you. Item number 20, sign pay orders and approve payments of bills. Make a motion to pay our bills. Motion's made by Commissioner uh, Parker for approval. Second. Second by Commissioner Fitch. Any discussion there? All in favor say aye. 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 All right, closing comments. Uh, I will not be here at our next meeting two weeks from now. Uh, I've asked uh, Commissioner Parker if he will chair that meeting. I'll keep that agenda uh, slim just to help expedite there in my absence. We may have a meeting uh, at an oddball time, uh, either just before or just after that meeting, perhaps to approve some uh, progress there at the Justice Center. Um, I don't think there's, I don't think that I have anything else here. Well, hold on. Barbara has prepared a uh, list of dates helping us with the budget calendar that goes all the way from April 30th where the chief appraiser provided preliminary tax roll values and it carries all the way through the uh, mid-September when we'll conduct public hearings on budget and tax rate and actually adopt the budget, approve the tax rate. I will get a copy to each one of you on these. Uh, some of these dates are pretty fixed. Some of them have some flexibility and we'll work with those in the next few months. But I'll, that way you can mark your calendars tentatively. We are having our budget hearings beginning this Thursday of this week, Thursday and Friday for half a day right here in this courtroom and we'll begin the discussions with our department heads. Um, they have been informed of that. So we're, we're trying to get a little earlier in the process, and we're about a month earlier. Instead of waiting till July, we're beginning this in June, and maybe we can end up with uh, our budget and tax rate work being done before the deadline of 9.30. So we will see you all Thursday here in this room. Barbara, thank you for that calendar. That helps us uh, kind of plan, and I'll get you all a copy of that. Will you? Would you rather have this emailed or a paper copy? It doesn't matter. Just hmm. email. Be good. Okay. It'll be fine. Will you email them a copy of that after we get a copy to Joyce? Hmm. Or you can put it in our box, run a copy. Yeah. Just put a hard copy in a box, be fine. Yeah. Okay. Or if you want to make them copies right now and give it to them before they leave, you can be done. Let us get one before we leave. That's all I have. Commissioner Parch. I just want to say, say a big thank you to American National Bank for their contribution to this flag box that we were receiving. Yes, sir. What's that? 
Yeah, I just want to say thanks to American National Bank. It's really exciting about the new flag disposal box, and then uh, I'm really excited about the new truck that Five Star got the uh, grant for and uh, the improvement to the volunteer fire department out there. They're good guys to work with. No. Commissioner <clears throat> Applewhite. Nothing. Commissioner I'd, Parker. I'd just like to to uh, tell Dana that I know he's been in pain today. <laughs> he, uh, he, for those that don't know, Dana fell off a ladder, what, three weeks ago? Mm -hmm. And has been in considerable pain. And I watched him over here this morning. <laughs> he's been in, in pain sitting up here in this meeting. So I, I just like to tell him that I hope he gets feeling better. I appreciate it. Thank and, you. Uh, that, wasn't, that wasn't a work comp claim, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no. Not for the county, no, anyway. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I've got something, uh, Byron Underwood with Bain Construction would like to say a word or two. Well, if he suffered through this whole meeting, Ooh, he, he deserves it. I want to just say thank y'all, we appreciate your business. We're glad you're dealing with Parker and y'all, and we got you to do this over there. And I think that you're really going to be pleased with it. But thank y'all for your time, your business, and appreciate what y'all done. Thank you, Byron. Thank you, Byron. All right. If there's nothing else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank Make you. a motion. Motion is made by Commissioner Parchman. Second. Second by Commissioner Applewhite. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you.